So good morning uh, to those connecting in this morning. My name is Dr. Mark Reller from the Division of Pediatric Cardiology here at Dornbecker. I want to introduce our 50th visiting Kazan uh, professor uh, and lecturer. This uh, tradition goes back to the early 1970s. The endowed professorship was funded by grandparents who wanted to honor the memory of a grandson who died from complications of congenital heart disease. The little boy had transposition of the great arteries. The express goal of the uh, endowed lectureship was to further our understanding and improve the care of our children with congenital heart disease. We uh, attempted to do just that by inviting leaders in the field over the past 50 years. And indeed, if you look at the list, uh, it reads like a who's who of pediatric cardiology. But the casting event is a special day for our program. We try to slow things down by closing the clinics, the cath lab, the OR, uh, to, so that as many of the faculty and staff in the program can attend the educational events associated with the casting. Uh, last, I wanted to say that if the casting grandparents who initially funded this endowment were still alive today, they'd be they'd be amazed by the progress and the changes that have taken place during this time frame. I would like to tell them if they were here today that 50 years hence, they'll still be a casting uh, visiting professorship and we'll still be refunding the care and making improvements, hopefully. So with that introduction, and I would like to ask my associate, Dr. Balazi, to introduce today's uh, casting professor. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Dr. Raller. Uh, hope you, can people hear me? Uh, well, it's, it's really an honor to introduce my friend, uh, and senior colleague in our field, uh, Dr. Peter Karpovich uh, from Detroit. So uh, I was I was just telling uh, Dr. Karpovich, you know, that the sign of a, a great s a scholar and a great uh, academic is when you read their CV and you're totally in awe and uh, uh, envious of all the things they've done. But uh, uh, Dr. Karpovich, did his MD from Drexel University, his uh, internship and residency from UT Southwestern in Dallas. And then he did his pediatric cardiology fellowship at Texas Children's Hospital, Baylor College of Medicine. And at that time, that's really where pediatric uh, arrhythmia management, electrophysiology began. And uh, the, uh, the one degree of separation I have with Dr. Karpa, which is that uh, we both share the same mentor, Dr. Paul Gillette who really was the pioneer of uh, pediatric electrophysiology. And uh, Dr. Karpovich was really at the first wave. Uh, some of the initial papers that he wrote uh, read like a uh, who's who of uh, pediatric cardiology uh, royalty. Uh, people like Dr. Denton Cooley, Dan McNamara, Paul Gillette. These are names that uh, really inspire awe and respect in all of us. Uh, I, I could go on and on. Uh, basically, he's been a great scholar. He's been one of the pioneers in the field of cardiac pacing in children. And really, a lot of the things that we do in terms of pacing uh, in children uh, goes back to Dr. Karpovich and his lab work. So without uh, going on and on, uh, which I can clearly do, I'm going to let Dr. Karpovich take away the talk today with this very intriguing title, which uh, just like you all, I'm very curious to hear. Thank you very much. Peter, take it away. Okay, thank you, Blasi. Uh, and again, I'd like to thank the organizers uh, for this opportunity and the honor to be part of this uh, visiting lecture series at university. So the concept is going to be cardiac pacing in children. And I added the subset of then, now, and tomorrow. And hopefully uh, this will be both educational and hope entertaining uh, since it really isn't a field that most pediatricians know much about. Yet, uh, it is an important field since you are going to run into patients who do have uh, de cardiac devices. In 1978-80, there was a BBC production called Connections. Some of you might remember it. Uh, it's still available on YouTube. And the idea was how James Burke would take seemingly completely different concepts and how they actually were connected. For example, how malaria in Java uh, was connected to the development of disposable razor blades. Uh, to throw in the middle was the British uh, a desire to have gin and tonic. So actually they were all connected. So in that field, 
I'd like to take the idea of how electric cords, shoe polish, transistor radios, steroids, and current nanotechnology are all connected in the development of cardiac pacing. I don't have any disclosures. The concept that children need pacemakers is yes, they do. Now again, pediatric pacing is less than 1% of the total volume of uh, devices in, implanted in anybody. So it is a factor that the vast majority of research done initially in pacemakers was not designed for children. They were designed for adults. And we had to extrapolate down to allow them to be used in younger patients. Children do have congenital heart block, long QT syndrome, a congenital corrected transposition. They can have heart block due to myocarditis, Lyme's disease, uh, COVID, um, and also more commonly is going to be post-surgical repair. So a lot of these devices and changes in pacemaker technology are starting at about the same time that congenital heart surgical repair is really getting going in the 70s and 80s. So it's been a long process. There have been uh, multiple concepts that have been put out by engineers, designs, failures and successes. And what I'd like to do is to go over some of these because it is quite fascinating how we've reached the point that we are today. Mankind has known that there is a force in nature. Don't know what it is. You can attribute it to angry gods, Thor and his lightning bolts. But also in nature, there were torpedo fish and electric eels. The Romans would actually bathe in bathtubs with electric eels in them and get stimulated. And around 600 BC, the Greeks figured out there was a substance in amber that they called electron, and it was able to attract cloth and feathers. They didn't know what it was, but we know it today as static electricity. If we jump ahead to the 16th and 17th century, uh, individuals figured out you could actually create spinning balls that would make static electricity. Uh, they did these, you would then go to a parlor, and you would have parties and people would touch the ball and touch each other and send static electricity through their bodies. It was a lot of fun, but again, it was mostly as a novelty more than anything else. However, we're jumping ahead another hundred years, Galvani and Volta figured out that this concept of electric charges could be triggered by making what we now call batteries. And Stimulation things were done in research labs. Uh, we all talk about the frog stimulation experiment that some of us did in high school, where you stimulated a leg, a frog leg, and it would twitch. And they looked at uh, live animals, they looked at dead animals, and the idea was maybe this electrical activity, this force in nature, could be used to reanimate dead tissue or to resuscitate uh, tissue at the same time. So therefore, we now jump uh, into the 18th and 19th centuries where this was actually put into some clinical uh, usefulness. Uh, the first known concept was to take a Galvani uh, battery and shove it down uh, someone's throat during a, a cardiac arrest to try to esophageal stimulate the heart. Trans uh, thoracic uh, by needles was uh, thought about in uh, a little bit later in the 1870s. And then in uh, 1899, the British Medical Journal, uh, a Dr. McWilliam published the first time of putting a catheter through a vein down into the heart to stimulate. So all of this is interrelated with our three friends in electricity of Edison, uh, Westinghouse, and Tesla. And by the turn of the century, now you have households with electricity and along with electricity come individuals inventing different machines that are going to use electricity and either light bulbs or radios or whatever they're going to make it evolved the whole concept and of course this was behind uh the idea that we could stimulate dead tissue and of course mary shelley you know took that to the nth degree in uh young either frankenstein or frankenstein depending on if you're going to listen to mel brooks or anybody else uh that the reanimation of dead tissue was a potential entity that could be uh, performed. However, dead tissue, no, but some viable tissue, yes. And the first known publication of cardiac stimulation that was actually very effective was in 1929 in Australia. And this was uh, presented as a case report. And 
in a newborn where he invented a machine that plugged into the wall, had a transthoracic needle, and they were resuscitating a newborn. Doesn't indicate of what was wrong with the newborn, either congenital heart block or some cardiac arrest for some reason, and actually stabbed into the heart and resuscitated this newborn. The inborn did survive. So this became the first known use of a pacemaker effectively clinically, and again, it was done in pediatrics. But that was a plug-in system. Around the same time, a Dr. Heyman here in the United States was working on a portable non-plug-in device. Uh, he had a magneto generator, which was hand cranked and emitted an electric charge. And again, using the same idea, he would stab it into the chest to uh, stimulate the heart. You could crank up the energy to try to resuscitate uh, people that are having cardiac arrests. He called it the heart tickler. That didn't go over too well, and then he coined the term pacemaker. So this is where the term pacemaker comes from due to Dr. Heyman. He then took the hand crank device and using battery power, created this portable small device that you could put into a doctor bag and you could go to a cardiac arrest, stab the patient into the heart and try to re-stimulate the heart. He tried to sell this to the United States Navy during the Second World War, uh, it wasn't really that effective. And we really don't have any known uh, ideas of how effective this was as a clinical tool, but it was out there and it started the concept of thoracic pacing. Paul Zoll, then a little bit later in the 1950s, took that same concept that we use today of transthoracic cutaneous pacing that now all defibrillators that we have in ERs and operating rooms also have the ability to pace the heart. And this all goes back to those original concepts of taking a needle, stabbing it into the heart from the outside as an emergency situation. So those evolved into how to quickly do an emergency cardiac stimulation, but there wasn't any real concepts of how to chronically pace the heart. Jump ahead to, again, into the mid 50s. And this is a classic story. You can go online and read about it. This is uh, Dr. Furman in Montefiore Medical Center in New York. Uh, the individual was actually Mr. Uh, uh, Pincus Shapiro. He had uh, some car coronary disease and had a transient heart block. So Dr. Furman put in a transvenous uh, lead and attached it to a very portable pacemaker, as you can see on top of the uh, cart. And his concept was, well, this was plugged into the wall. So what he would do is take a 100-foot extension cord. So as Mr. Shapiro got out of his bed, he would then plug in the extension cord in his room, made sure that he had a very strong nurse walking alongside Mr. Shapiro. He would walk the length of the 100-foot extension cord. Dr. Furman would then quickly unplug and run to the next wall socket and plug it in before Mr. Shapiro collapsed. So Mr. Shapiro would then pick up again, and he would continue his daily walking up and down the corridors of Montefiore Medical Center. The concept of transvenous chronic pacing then improved uh, over time. What happened to Mr. Shapiro is that he did recover, Here's uh, him and his nurse and uh, Dr. Furman. And to make sure that Mr. Shapiro stayed a cardiac patient, Dr. Furman provided him with cigars on a daily basis so he kept his coronary disease going. Transvenous chronic pacing then improved uh, into the mid to late 50s by small battery powered devices. You could go home with them. And of course, on the left, you have a typical model I doubt there was too many uh, young men in the 1950s that required this. More than likely, they were typical as the individual on the right-hand side, an elderly person probably with coronary disease and intermittent heart block. But they were able to go home with these battery-powered pacemakers with leads uh, attached transvenously or epicardially uh, into the heart. So they would be able to ambulate around the house uh, with these uh, temporary devices, but on a chronic pacing basis. That pretty much goes all through the 50s. And then in the late 50s, there was a real, real jump in technology. In Sweden, there was uh, Drs. Elmquist and Svenning 
Senning is the same doctor of the Senning procedure that was used for the uh, transposition. Most people are aware of the mustard procedure. There also was a Senning procedure. And there was an individual named Arn Larson. He had Stokes Adams syncope. And Mrs. Larson, Elsa, found out about this research being done. Uh, I believe it was Uppsala University in Sweden. She contacted uh, Elmquist and Senning and asked him about this pacemaker that they were working on in animals. And they said, well, yeah, we have it in animals, but we've never applied one to people. So Elsa apparently was a very forward type of woman. And uh, she said, well, then then make one for my husband. And they did. So they basically took a Kiwi shoe polish can, a nickel cadmium battery, transistor radio circuits that were all the rage at the time, embedded everything in epoxy resin, had a couple wires attached, and then attached the wires to Mr. Larson's heart. That's Mr. Larson on the right, sending in the middle, and Elmquist on the left. Mr. Larson lived until 2001 with multiple, multiple pacemakers. He actually did outlive Elmquist and Senning. So the idea of an implantable device took root in the 1960s. So now we have the evolution of implantable devices, but took a look at the size of a shoe polish can, and you're talking about the size of a hockey puck. So again, pediatric pacing is really not there yet. The concepts that we looked at in the 1960s all through the 80s were how to best protect the circuitry and prevent infection. So the original idea of embedding everything in epoxy was used uh, pretty much throughout the 60s and into the 70s. By the mid to late 70s, the pacemakers started to get embedded in a titanium shell. We'll talk about that in a sec. The circuitry during this period of time also evolved. Uh, you, in the 1970s, you have the very beginnings of computers and the transistor radios, the transistors that were used were switched over to circuit boards and uh, microchips. The original devices only had fixed heart rates. They were changed uh, to allow for some uh, variability of the heart rate. And some of the early devices actually had a port and the device is under the skin. And the physician would take a, a very sharp, essentially screwdriver and go through the skin, go into the port of the pacemaker and then turn it to adjust the heart rate or they could also adjust the output. So along this time, pacemakers lasted a couple months, maybe a year, and there was the idea of what do we do about the energy source? How are we going to make these devices last longer if we're going oh, to put them in young people? And the idea of putting them in young people uh, gets more and more important as the technology improves. Again, we're not dealing too much with children yet. We're still dealing with adults. But there were rechargeable pacemakers. Now, the recharge didn't last very long. Uh, you'd be the equivalent today of having to recharge your phone about three or four times a day. And of course, people being what they are, they would charge up their rechargeable pacemaker, go off running around and doing things and forget to charge themselves up at night. And of course, that had catastrophic consequences. So then they switched over to nickel cadmium batteries. Well, they last a little bit longer. You might get a year or so out of it. And then finally, lithium iodide batteries start coming into uh, fruition around the 1970s. But it's still very young technology and not very reliable, and the batteries don't last very long. So researchers at this period of time are starting to think, OK, what can we do to maintain battery longevity? And the obvious answer was plutonium. So we have an isotope of plutonium, 238, that had an 87-year half-life. And actually, this was made into pacemakers. Um, they lasted forever. And that was the concept, is that if you had a pacemaker, you only needed one per life. Of course, you are dealing with plutonium. And uh, as lithium technology improved and the batteries got better, concern of uh, little explosions inside people's chest you know, occurred. So the whole concept of a plutonium-triggered nuclear pacemaker fell out of favor. However, as of 2001, there were still about 100 people uh, in the world with nuclear pacemakers in, uh, still implanted. I doubt any are still alive today. They might be. But just in case, if you do find a nuclear-powered pacemaker sitting around uh, in some patient that has just been explanted, 
do not throw it into an autoclave, it will explode, and you'd probably have a little Chernobyl growing up in your research lab, and you probably don't want to do that, but you can contact the off-site source recovery program, and the government will come and pick up your nuclear pacemaker for you. Another thing that some of us remember back in the 80s and into the early 90s, in every hospital cafeteria, you saw this sign, danger, pacemaker wearer, do not enter this room, microwave ovens in use. And the idea being that, yes, with the, lift, with the pacemakers that were embedded in epoxy, microwaves did affect the pacemakers and they would shut them off. Uh, with the evolution of placing the devices in a titanium shell, that is no longer an issue. So if you do see any of these still in your hospital, you can remove them. Uh, no one has any epoxy embedded pacemakers anymore. So what I tell patients today is that all household appliances are usable. You can use microwaves, but uh, as opposed to this individual who made world history by getting his head stuck in a microwave, just don't put your head in a microwave. You could get stuck and you can then make a video tube of yourself trying to be extracted from a pacemaker. One concern, however, that has persisted is the use of cell phones, uh, especially some of the new iPod cell phones. We still tell patients, if you have a cell phone, do not put it over your device. Cell phones will be the energy that it will be picked up by the pacemaker and can set it to a magnet mode or actually shut the pacemaker off. So always put the device on the opposite ear from where the pacemaker is located and never rest your pacemaker uh, or your cell phone directly on the region of your abdomen if it's a child or in the shoulder area um, because it can affect the pacemaker. So that is still uh, a, war a warning that is put out with devices. These are the pioneers. And again, of most of them, we see Paul uh, Gillette, that, uh, as Dr. Balaji mentioned, was both of our mentors, and Dr. William Lelahai. Dr. Lelahai uh, was some of the early pioneers, even before Denton Cooley, of doing uh, congenital heart surgery. Uh, the other individuals were all uh, internal medicine cardiology. Um, but because of Dr. Lelahai's work in the 1970s, uh, we start having the need for pacemaker development in children. And what you end up with is the advantages in congenital heart surgery of younger and younger children now uh, having surgery. And again, this was also, uh, Dr. Balaji mentioned uh, Dr. Denton Kulik, who I had the uh, pleasure to work with during my training, uh, really was a advocate of the heart-lung machine, uh, which apparently, according uh, to some issues, he stole from his mentor, but that's another story. But uh, congenital heart surgery starts getting going in the 70s and into the 80s, but because of putting patients on the heart-lung machine or doing surgery, especially for VSDs or AV canals or aortic valves, you had damage to the sinus and AV node. So now you had successful surgery, defects were closed, but now children had heart block and they needed permanent cardiac pacing. Along with that, more recently, which we'll talk about in a little bit, uh, are the effects of lifelong pacing. So we have then the need for permanent cardiac pacing in children, and then what happens if you have a child who has 50 or 60 years of cardiac pacing, does that cause any problems? When we talk about a pacemaker, it's not just one unit. It's actually three components, and this is where people get confused. So if someone says, I have a problem with their pacemaker, the uh, cardiologist has to figure out, is it with the what we call the pulse generator, the implantable pulse generator, or IPG? And that contains the battery and the circuitry. Is it the lead, the wire that attaches to the heart? Or is it the electrode that literally is the reason the lead is able to fix to the heart itself? So if we have a problem with a pacemaker, in the current era, we figure out, well, is it the battery problem? Is it a circuitry problem, a lead problem, or is it an electrode problem? This is a picture of Dr. Lillehei in a child uh, after post-surgery, and you see the child does have one of those temporary transvenous or epicardial wires attached. Uh, hopefully, he recovered because at this point in time, implantable devices are quite large for children. And the major concerns that we dealt with in the 60s, 70s, and 80s was, first of all, the electrotissue interface reaction. If you get a 
a splinter, you develop a reaction. You get a pustule and you get edema and swelling. The same thing happens when you attach metal to the heart. There is going to be a reaction at the surface of the tissue reaction to the electrode. The lead that conducts the energy to and fro the heart had to be at the time quite large and that caused vascular and valvular damage to children. And because of the need to have high energy to get through the scar tissue, generators had to be large. So therefore you ended up with problems of, pay, of erosion, which still occurs among children and even uh, some of the elderly uh, with very uh, thin skin. And finally, the ultimate problem in children was patient growth. So this actually is a photograph of a patient of mine who is now in his 50s, was taken when he was about three years old. And you can see one of the old hockey puck epoxy embedded uh, pacemakers in his abdomen. He had an AV canal defect. He is still going strong. Uh, he still has a pacemaker, uh, but his devices obviously are a lot smaller. Uh, vascular obstruction is a problem with some of the older leads. We'll talk about some of the newer lead developments. And of course, growth and fracture well, were always a problem with children and still remain an issue. Uh, in the 1980s, we were also left with the concept of some of the children were so small that there was no marketable, commercially available transvenous pacing system. So we had to MacGyver, as it were, and make our own. So this was one uh, reason that you could uh, get away with stuff back then because we didn't have anything else to work with. And uh, making your own pacemaker lead was not a unusual concept to play with, at least as a temporary lead to stabilize a child prior to uh, getting a permanent pacemaker implant. So the first real concepts were, well, we know that everything goes back to the tip electrode and the tip electrode is attached to the wire, which attaches to the can of the pacemaker. So the research was really focused on how do we decrease that electro tissue reaction causing the big scar tissue, which needed the big batteries to get through the scar tissue. And therefore you had large pacemaker cans, which were not suitable for children. And again, the term was the leads were always the Achilles heel of cardiac pacing. So let's try to fix the leads first. And if we fix the leads along the idea of connections, we are going to be able to improve the circuitry and make the cans of the pacemaker smaller. So we had two parallel developments in the 1980s into the 1990s. Uh, the conductor coil, the metal that actually is inside the wire that conducts the electricity back and forth and senses uh, was able to be improved. Today we have what we call MRI conditional uh, wires. So now pacemakers uh, are allowed to, uh, pacemakers with pacemakers are allowed to have MRIs performed. The insulation was a major, major problem in the 1980s. Uh, again, you're dealing with the wire in the human body. There are all sorts of reactions that take place. And along with the reactions are dissolvement of the silicone and the polyurethanes. There was breaking, fracturing, and lead erosion, which caused a lot of problems. This eventually was uh, finally figured out by the late 80s and into the 90s. The electrodes, uh, the tissue material uh, that was used was either carbon, titanium, or platinum. We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, and again, materials that would decrease the inflammatory response. And then finally, how to fix pacemaker leads inside the heart and outside the heart. The first device, the first leads had no fixation whatsoever. You just kind of wedged it into the apex of the right ventricle, hoping for the best. You had lots of dislodgement at that time, and therefore more uh, available fixation capabilities such as little grappling hooks or tines. There are also little fish hooks that were attached, helixes that were retractable and not retractable. And then on the outside of the heart, you had little helixes and also suture rod devices. So we're starting to get leads now that can be used even in the smallest children. This is what we're talking about when we talked about the electro tissue interface. <clears throat> If you had a uh, tissue material, you ended up with a reaction taking place at the region of the inflammatory response. What that did is it increased the need of the energy of the device to bypass the inflammatory response 
for the first month or so, and then you ended up with what was called a stable threshold, which was oftentimes could be twice the implant threshold. What that meant is you needed pacemakers that could produce 10, 12, 15, even 20 volts of uh, output to get through the scar tissue. That meant large batteries. These, therefore, were not effective for children. So the idea being, what can we do to make the leads better and decrease that inflammatory response? This is an example in an animal a model of different lead designs. And you can see here the inflammatory response with one lead design, less with another lead design. So there was improvement. And what we figured out is that if you actually change the texture of the lead itself, you made it more, a term was used was spiculed. In, instead of a nail, you ended up with uh, very fine materials. So you had less of an inflammatory response and therefore uh, less of the capsule. If you had decreased inflammation, you had a small capsule, you no longer needed large batteries. Now we can downsize, 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 and get to small pacemaker cans that can be used in any age patient. And this is in the late 80s, early 90s now. Into the 90s and early 90s, mid 90s, we start to add steroid. So now we're really decreasing that inflammatory response. The uh, first epicardial uh, steroid eluting leads came out in 1992. And the first transvenous endocardial lead, which was only a four French diameter, came out in 2005. However, the FDA, uh, since we were dealing with steroids in children, it took essentially seven years to convince them that we are not creating little Arnold Schwarzeneggers out of children because they have steroid elution in their pacemaker leads. The concept was that we went back to the animal lab and showed that the steroid literally just stayed in the small little capsule that was created. It wasn't dissipated through the body. The children did not start doing push-ups and pull-ups at the age of three and didn't develop large muscles. So steroid elution then became the norm. And pretty much every lead that is used today is a low threshold, uh, fractated surface to decrease the inflammatory response. And along with that, steroid is, is added to eat further decrease the inflammatory response. So now you have leads that are very stable and don't cause the reactions. So now the batteries can be downsized even more. So now we end in the current era. Pacemakers are quite small. And you can see the evolution over time on the right-hand side. Pacemakers uh, can change the output. Everything is done by radio frequency signal now, which again is a problem with some cell phones and iPads. Uh, we can adjust the sensing. We can adjust the rate. Pacemakers will respond to body activity. All you have to do is just uh, start running and your pacemaker will pick up if your own heart rate doesn't pick up. And we can do little mini EP studies. Pacemakers can actually overdrive uh, different types of flutter. So if you have a patient with uh, uh, atrial tachycardia, even ventricular tachycardia, uh, you can actually have the pacemaker programmed that not only will it pace the heart, it will do a little uh, program stimulation to overdrive pacing and terminate tachycardias. Uh, diagnostically, remote monitoring is the norm. Uh, patients now can have their pacemakers tested at home. Uh, we have uh, companies that do provide 24-7 monitoring. The patient just calls it in if they have trouble, if they're at home. And this is very uh, effective, especially if the geographically uh, the patient is at a distance from the medical center, which is pretty much in most of the Midwest uh, regions. They just call it in and uh, our fellow goes online and either confirms or uh, tells them that you, don't, you do have a problem, come on in, or you don't have a problem, don't worry about it. Um, they do pick up people that are having respiratory problems. And very interestingly, they also now can help pick up and have heart failure. Someone's talking along with me. Please mute yourself if you're not talking. Hello? But now I can't figure out the Okay, so a, a fascinating thing that I find today is that pacemakers can actually pick up on thoracic impedance. So uh, this is called the Optival, the optimum volume concept of a lot of devices. 
And if you have a patient, a congenital heart patient, surgical, that's going into heart failure, this will actually pick it up before the patient actually has any symptoms of heart failure. So the cardiologist can actually then tell the patient, okay, it looks like you are going, you are having problems, come on in, we need to adjust your afterload or your diuretics or your preload. Also, pacemakers now can pick up if you are having problems with the um, leads. It picks up if the lead insulation is having a fracture or if the conductor coil is having a problem. The most recent uh, ability with pacemakers now is that you can pace both sides of a left or a right ventricle as a resynchronization concept. So for heart failure, and this has been done for children and young adults with a repaired congenital heart or with congenital heart block, as a bridge to transplant. We've been doing it now for over 20 years, and it is very effective and can delay the need for transplant in patients by what they call resynchronizing the ventricle to make it pump uh, both from the right and the left side um, as a effective therapy. And then finally, like I told you earlier, new pacemakers are now MRI conditional. The metal has been changed, the internal circuitry has been changed, so most, most people with pacemakers now can have MRIs. The latest development is now uh, came out in 2016, approved by the FDA, it is a leadless pacemaker. As I said earlier, leads have been the, quote, Achilles tendon or the Achilles uh, uh, factor of uh, problems. So getting rid of the leads was an idea of the 1980s, which finally came to fruition uh, a few years ago. Uh, unfortunately, the current design is specifically to go to the apex. Uh, people have tried to put it in other areas. It's been plus or minus whether it's effective. One of the problems in children is that it is a very large delivery catheter that is necessary, a basically 23 French, which is about uh, almost 7.7 uh, millimeters. And uh, extraction is a concern. Uh, tissue does grow into it, especially if you're talking about putting one in a child. And MRI, there are still issues of whether or not you can have MRIs done with these devices. A recent publication came out of Ireland, uh, just published last year in Pediatric Cardiology, of their use of this device in nine uh, children. They were all teenagers, unfortunately, so you don't have anything younger. And of the nine, one of them actually, the, the device failed. They left it in place and had to put a uh, standard transvenous lead and a pacemaker in a position at that time. So this is new technology that you'll probably read about more and more in the future. Uh, I think it will continue because again, people uh, realize that leads are an issue. And especially again, since uh, most people that have pacemakers are going to be 70, 80 years old, and they may only need one pacemaker per life, the usefulness in this children uh, is still uh, up for grabs. Uh, there is a study being started by the Pediatric and Congenital Heart Electrophysiology Society uh, of people starting to put some of these in maybe teenagers. So the jury's still out of how effective this is gonna be in our pediatric population. So we're up to leadless pacemakers. The device is tiny. The leads don't cause any problems, but are there problems with chronic pacing? As I said before, if you have a 60, 70, 80 year old who has a heart condition uh, and has a, had an infarct, um, does it really matter if there is adverse pacing uh, effects of pacing itself? The answer is probably not. But if you have an infant or a two or three or a 10 year old uh, and you're going to pace for the next 50, 60 years, are there potential problems with cardiac stimulation? And the answer is yes. If we look at normal sinus rhythm, the heart is designed to contract and spin in a certain area due to the actual morphology of the heart muscle. It's not a simple contraction, it's actually a spinning and twisting of radial muscles, longitudinal and lateral muscles. So if we look at the concept, we can then equate it to, well, when the Tower of Pisa was built, this is pretty much what it looked like. It's a nice straight upright tower. Unfortunately, over time, as most of us know, the a composition of the ground underneath the tower started to fail due to the weight of the tower itself, leading us to the Leaning Tower of Pisa. And this is what we end up with when we talk about pacing the heart. The heart contracts in a different manner. And as it contracts in a different manner, you end up with cellular changes. The cellular changes then go to contractility changes. And these contractility changes then go to actual 
myocardial dysfunction. On the left here, on the pacing sites, you see four different locations. And on the right, you see what's called a pressure volume loop. Uh, the black line is normal sinus rhythm. And what this tells you is how well does the ventricle contract with each uh, stimulation. So in sinus rhythm, you have a what we call a normal pressure volume loop. And as you can see at the different locations along the right ventricular septum, the pressure volume loop can get distorted phenomenally. And if you look at the pink area, which would be along the right ventricular output tract, you can see that the contractility of the ventricle is very diminished, leading to a heart failure concept. So we know that depending on where you put leads is very important. Can we do anything about it? And the answer is yes. So in the current era, what we look at today is where do you put the lead? Don't just slap it any place in the heart. You need to look ahead of time to see where is the best location to put the lead. So Putting it in a good location ends up with a good response. And if you have a good response, you will potentially prevent any chronic problems over 10, 20, 30, 40 years of a patient developing myocardial dysfunction and pacing-induced heart failure. So like anything else in life, where the lead is placed, it's location, location, location. And this is another one of the uh, big issues today of lead implants don't just put the pacemaker in the apex, test ahead of time, make sure you put it in, in a location that's not gonna be detrimental. Where do we go from here? Well, we're now in the 21st century and the small edible multi-flavored leadless pacemaker, well, we're probably not there yet. However, we are here. So this is where the current technology is going. Micro rechargeable radio frequency, tiny little pacemakers, the size again of those implantable leadless devices where the lithium cell now can be recharged and will last longer, pretty much like your cell phone. So maybe now only once a day, as opposed to three or four times a day in a very small encapsulated device that screws directly into the heart, like the current leadless designs. Alternate energy sources have always been a fascinating concept in pacemaker technology. Some of the um, things being touted today are a solar panel where you would have a subcutaneous device put, especially maybe in the neck or if you're bald on your scalp, so you have chronic sunshine. I'm not so sure about how that would work in Portland and Washington with the rain you have up there. Uh, would work very well probably in Arizona but uh, the idea being of using sunlight as a source to uh, charge the batteries. Um, this is something that, again, is being looked at. Another one is that we do have self-winding watches. So why can't we have a pacemaker that winds itself due to cardiac contractility? Also piezoelectrocrystals due to the constant contractility of the heart can recharge up the batteries of the pacemakers. Again, technology is looking at that. Also uh, placing a semiconductor uh, thermocouples under the skin where you have a char charge of temperature, which will then allow for a energy source to be created and uh, delete the need for any batteries themselves. One of the more fascinating ideas that has been around since the 1990s has been cell to cell a change. So either a stem cell transplant or taking existing cells and using a gene bell based re-engineering, reprogramming, make those cells into essentially sinus node or AV node cells. You would plant it into the heart tissue and therefore you completely remove the need for any mechanical uh, devices. Unfortunately, some of the early issues that came out with this is that you ended up having essentially a tumor that would be a tachycardia tumor. You could not uh, change the rate. Uh, so that type of technology is still out there, but again, still being looked at at certain medical centers. So there we end up that in 60 years, cardiac pacing has undergone remarkable advances has been a lifesaver to countless patients. And although now applicable to most patients, the challenges of device size, longevity, need for replacement, prevention of complication, 
and approved applications to even the smallest patients still remain and will continue to be, uh, hopefully, uh, interest in research and will allow us to be able to apply <clears throat> these pacemakers to even the youngest, youngest children that we have. So again, uh, thank you for this opportunity uh, to uh, give this presentation. Um, I hope it uh, was informative and uh, at least somewhat interesting. And uh, I'll, if we can, uh, ask any questions. And again, I thank the uh, organizers, Dr. Balaji, for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Awesome talk. Uh, any questions from anybody? Uh, I'm not seeing many questions on the uh, chat board, but I think that was a uh, instruction to send questions through the chat uh, feature. Uh, anybody have any? I, I have one question, Balaji. Um, Please. Dr. Coverage, Lars Gross Wartman again. Um, so that was a fascinating talk, and uh, you know, I can assure you, you're your worries that this may not be have been interested interesting to um, pediatricians is entirely unfounded. So thank you very much for this really entertaining uh, talk. Uh, one of the lessons I took away from your talk was that you know for successful development or advancement of of technology, uh, many things need to come together, and if it's just uh, an advancement in, in one area and the other areas aren't ready yet, it's it's going to fail. Um, so, um, you know, could you elaborate a little bit on this? You know, uh, and and what things need to come together, for example, for um, you know biological pacemakers to uh, take effect. You alluded a little bit on you know why why what the limitations are, but. Um, are you able to comment on implantation techniques? How do we get the cells to where they need to be? Um, you know, whether it's an injection or a patch. Um, are you in the know of any yeah. of that? Yeah, I think the some of the work that uh, Mike Rosen did back in Columbia in the 90s, I remember chatting with him about this. Uh, yeah, it would be an injection. Uh, you'd have a cell line. Um, and we all know that normal cells undergo apoptosis and you know natural program cell death and that was a, a concept that they couldn't overcome if they injected stem type cells you'd have to be able to um, make them grow and dissolve the same time as a normal cell would and what they found is that there was no you couldn't shut them off so they kept on growing and that was the concern uh, and i don't know where that technology is currently uh i know it's still being looked at um but again, possibly, you know, genetic programming something might be an issue. That's the concern. But I think you're right. Just like, for example, the large size of the devices, uh, they weren't ready to go down in size to fit into babies until we figured out how to make the original interface reaction with the electrode diminished. So it, it, it required the technology to first of all go at the site of the implant, and then you can make everything smaller along the way. And I think this is always going to be a concern. Uh, Solar-powered batteries, for example, sure, you can put it under someone's skin, but um, the skin tone is going to be a concern. Uh, there might be, you know, skin thickness might be an issue. Uh, something sticking out of your neck, uh, you know, some people might not want that. You know, where do you put it? Uh, that would be a concern. Uh, I think one of the, I think... Um, in, in our PACES uh, group, uh, 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 Charlie uh, Rule Sorry. over in Washington has done some uh, issues of having the heart contractility itself uh, re-stimulate the heart battery of the pacemaker. Uh, you would have to then ensure that you constantly had a heartbeat. All right, so you know it, it would depend on how fast does the heart have to go to stimulate the battery. But we do have piezo crystals. This is where the piezo crystal device of rate responsive pacemakers that came out in the 90s, where all you had to do was tap on the chest or start running and the heart rate would pick up and it would go down as you relaxed. That's a very strong possibility in the current way people are thinking of a constant battery source without using lithium or plutonium, for example, you know, something that lasts a long time. So I think you're right. It's always going to be one connection after another. Uh, and looking at the limitations uh, getting there shouldn't be a problem 
you know, let's face it, surgeons are there, right there. The heart's right there. You can always put something on the heart. And catheter delivery is not a problem. Uh, it's going to be the ability of whatever we put in to uh, work effectively for a length of time. And then obviously in children, 50, 60 years of pacing, is there going to be any problem with, do we have to remove that device? And what are the complications of that removal? And that's one of the concerns right now with the current leadless device. And like I said, the jury's still out on that. Uh, thank you, Peter. Uh, I have a comment and a question. So, uh, <coughs> certainly the group at uh, University of Southern California, Yanni Bar Cohen and them, they've been working on pacemakers that can be implanted in fetuses as well. Uh, you didn't allude to that. So, uh, miniaturization is definitely going to be happening and, and, and a huge factor going forward. The, the question I have for you, Peter, is, you know, whenever a patient with a pacemaker comes into the clinic or the emergency room or somewhere like that, there is a lot of fear uh, that, you know, people could do something and, and make the pacemaker not work or, uh, I mean, one of the things I, I think you already alluded to this, is that there are very few uh, problems of that nature and, and these are very uh, robustly made. So are there any situations where uh, pediatricians caring for pacemaker patients should be concerned? Well, like I said, um, a lot of the problems we figured out in the 80s and 90s. Uh, cell phones are still an issue and all most people need to recognize is that anything you have in the house electrically is okay. Like I said, just don't put your head in the microwave, all right? Pacemakers are still gonna be affected, um, ICDs as well, by large electromagnetic fields. So for example, if you wanna take a tour of Hoover Dam and they turn on our, our Niagara Falls power plant and they turn on the energy, you probably don't wanna do that. So that will confuse the pacemaker. But for anything you have in the household or in the hospital, uh, it pretty much is safe. And I think this is a leftover from the 70s and 80s when pacemaker technology was really still in its infancy, which is fascinating considering we were all around back then. You know? So um, it, uh, in the current era, you shouldn't be afraid of, of especially pacemakers. Uh, I think ICDs probably are more terrifying because they can shock the patient inappropriately. But as long as you're avoiding a very large uh, electromagnetic field, the pacemaker is really not going to be a problem. Uh, and in the worst case scenario, all it does is now revert to a fixed heart rate. It's called a magnet rate. Um, and it's really not going to uh, cause a problem to the patient. So if, if a patient comes into the ER and they have a pacemaker, uh, the pediatrician should not worry about it uh, as long as they, uh, again, don't uh, plop some electric device on the chest or the abdomen or wherever the pacemaker is located for the child, uh, which could interfere with the circuitry board. But otherwise, it, they're very much uh, a safe concept today, I think. Uh, and a lot of the concerns that were raised in the 70s and 80s have now been alleviated. Another question that keeps coming up uh, frequently in my experience is, uh, if a patient with a pacemaker or even, let's say, a defibrillator uh, has a cardiac arrest, should they be resuscitated? And are there any precautions that they should, uh, that the resuscitators should use? All we tell people is don't put the pads over the device. And I remember if you're shocking someone, if the if you have an ICD and the internal device doesn't work, uh, shocking from the outside might work, but again, you're using a lot more energy. Uh, uh, but if you don't, it might reset the device for a moment, but the, uh, even ICDs have the ability to have temporary pacing after the shock. Uh, with a pacemaker, uh, it might reset the device. Uh, and again, it will reset it to con uh, commonly a magnet mode, which typically is a rate of about 85. And then you can always reprogram it back up again. So again, yes, if you need to cardiovert, cardiovert, just don't put the pads directly on the device or right over the device. Uh, put them a distance away, but still maintain the vector force that you need to have an effective cardioversion. I see a comment from Dr. Mendelson, a senior colleague here in Portland that he now has had a pacemaker for two years, but he's never heard about keeping cell phones away from close contact with a pacemaker. Um, he, he should. <laughs> um, uh, the problem you're going to run into is that it, it could revert it to a magnet mode, or it could set it off 
uh, or to turn it down. So you might get symptomatic with it. Uh, it's the same thing we run into where I have patients who might work for uh, a company that has industrial generators, uh, Ford or GM here in the Detroit area. And if they might, uh, even people working at Kentucky Fried Chicken, uh, if they get too close to some of these uh, devices with a large electromagnetic field, they might feel dizzy. So just step away from it. It's definitely a physical distance concept. And again, with a night with a cell phone, yes, just use your other ear. Uh, if you're self, if you're right-handed, the device is probably under your left clavicle. Uh, just use your right ear. Uh, and if you're lying flat, don't just slap it on the device, but hold it a distance away. Uh, and this was a publication just recently came out in the American Heart Journal just uh, this past uh, couple months. So it's still something important with the iPads and the cell phones. Early, early when cell phones came out, this was a major problem. They try to rectify it, but as they keep improving the technology, there's still that concern. So it is a concern, uh, just something to avoid. And then uh, Dr. Silverbach has a question. Uh, there are transcription factors that maintain AV node function. Is there any effort to solve the problem of non-autoimmune congenital heart block? Again, well, that would be I a, uh, I know uh, uh, Jill Bynan had done a lot of work with, with that years ago. I don't know if she's still doing much with it. Uh, if you have non-immune, then uh, the idea being, like we talk about, there's two reasons to have heart block. One is the autoimmune, the other is an actual developmental problem with the AV node. Um, I'm not sure about how transcription factors might change a congenital AV node heart block. Uh, he's probably more versed on it than I am. Uh, but again, this goes along the lines of how do you take a abnormal AV node and make it normal, or can you replicate uh, the ability of an AV node to undergo spontaneous diastolic depolarization uh, and continue and yet not keep growing as a cell line causing a problem with the tachycardia-induced myopathy.